Okay. Firstly, can you can you see my slides and can you hear me? Absolutely, both are fine. Okay, that's super. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us, particularly in these slightly strange circumstances this year. So my job is to promote and support the increase of new woodland cover within the Central Scotland Conservancy area. Um, and as part of that, I primarily aim to help landowners understand the potential opportunities associated with the integration of forestry into existing rural businesses um, and to highlight the related grant funding opportunities. And that's what I'll be covering today. Um, coming from a farming family as I do, I know that both agriculture and forestry both have a key role in producing the resources required for our society, both now and into the future. And they are both very important. So just in terms of what I'll cover today, I'll just quickly run through the context of Scottish Government support for forestry, uh, details of the forestry grant scheme, uh, the drivers for integrating forestry with, into, with existing rural businesses, uh, and then I'll look at the livestock, crop and wider benefits associated with woodland creation. Sorry, just getting a bit trigger happy there. So just in terms of the, the policy context and the Scottish Government support for uh, uh, woodland creation, through the Climate Change Scotland Act 2019, Scotland is committed to reaching net zero by 2045, with interim greenhouse gas emissions uh, reductions of at least 54% by 2023, 75% by 2030 and 90% by 2040, so a lot to be done in a short time. And the, that has related targets of 15,000 hectares of new woodland creation per annum currently, rising to 18,000 hectares of woodland creation by 2025. And the Scottish Government's ambition for forestry is that by 2050, Scotland's woodland cover will increase from around 20% to 30% of the Scottish land area. So the, Scottish, the Forestry Grant Scheme, uh, which is part of the Scottish Rural Development Programme, offers landowners and managers attractive funding opportunities to plant new woodlands. Payments for planting woodland of different types and subsequent maintenance payments. Landowners in Scotland can receive grants of up to £6,210 per hectare towards the cost of new woodland planting, with monies for fencing and tree protection available in addition to this. So this table here, I don't know if you can all see my pointers, but I can see it, um, it, it illustrates initial planting and maintenance payments. Uh, the rates in this table do not include capital items such as fencing and tree shelter. Sorry, I see my, my slides have skipped on one. Uh, let me go back to the one it should be. Um, so there's the rates table uh, for the individual options, and that uh, is initial planting and maintenance payments, uh, and that doesn't include the capital items such as fencing and tree shelters. Bear in mind the cost of delivery, given that the rates reduce the schemes of 300 hectares or over. So back to the slide I was on a minute ago. Um, the Forestry Grant Scheme is a competitive scheme and open to applications all year round providing flexibility and helping farmers avoid any requirements to complete an application during busy periods. So as a former farmer's daughter, I'm never sure there were any uh, periods that weren't busy. Um, importantly, land planted under the forestry grant scheme remains eligible for the basic payment scheme. So as I mentioned, additional monies are available for capital items, uh, and that's outlined in the, the table in this slide. Um, and that includes three shelters, in terms of timescales, um, as a standard, straightforward applications may take three to four months between commencement of detailed survey and design for the production of an approved contract. Um, a complicated scheme involving specialist surveys, for example, uh, may take between four to six months. Applications are required to state what financial year works will be completed in, and it's possible to apply for fencing and planting works to be completed in separate financial years, and that may assist with project cash flow. So the capital grants are paid on completion of the works and maintenance payments are paid annually thereafter over the following five years. Just in terms of uh, making steps to try and get uh, uh, enhance your uh, possibility, pre application to a local woodland officer at Scottish Forestry is, is, is key to a successful application and to avoid delays in turnaround time, all information, information required to be at the outset. Information on eligibility and scoring for the Forestry Grant Scheme is available on the Rural Payments website and the link to that website is available at the end of this presentation. There are various regional uplifts associated with the Forestry Grant Scheme and specifically relevant to the Central Scotland Conservancy area is the Central Scotland Green Network contribution, uh, which offers a very, very valuable and attractive top up to national planting rates in CSGN area. Um, and that's the map included in this slide. 
The contribution exists in recognition of differential land ownership patterns in the central Scotland area compared to the rest of Scotland, where accessing large um, or accessing land for large areas of woodland planting is more challenging. The CSGN contribution is paid at £2,500 per hectare in the core area, which is a dark red area in the middle of the, the map here. £1,500 per hectare in the core area, which is this dark pink area here, and £750 per hectare in the fringe area. These payments can help generate surpluses on woodland creation schemes uh, dependent on individual scheme costs. In terms of eligibility, in the outer core area, um, areas of up to 65 hectares per application will be eligible for the contribution, while in the core and fringe areas, the limit will be up to 40 hectares per application. So the table in the slide here shows the initial planting rates and maintenance payments available in the CSGN area. Uh, it doesn't include monies paid for other capital items, such as fencing, uh, which are paid in addition. And just note the figures in the table are based on target area payments, which are identified as required or potential in your forestry and woodland strategies. There are various other regional uplifts, uplifts throughout Scotland, uh, for example, in the Lumond and Trossachs National Park and Cairngorms National Park, but I won't be going into detail on those today. But the detail of all those is available on the uh, Scottish Forestry website. The Forestry Grant Scheme also provides funding under the Sheep and Trees Initiative, um, and this enables applications for both woodland creation and forest infrastructure, such as roads. It's available to upland livestock farmers where sheep are a major component and where the farmer will continue to farm. The new woodlands must be between 10 hectares and 50 hectares of productive conifer. And please note that landowners cannot apply for Sheep and Trees Initiative as well as a CSGN contribution. And more information on the Sheep and Trees Initiative can be found on the Scottish Forestry website. In terms of budget availability, from October 2015 to the 1st of October 2020, over £210 million worth of funding were for 1,886 creation cases in Scotland, covering approximately 47,136 hectares of new planting. For 2021, the budget is £56.3 million, and that will grow in 2021 um, in line with woodland creation target increases. And going forward, there is strong Scottish Government commitment to continue funding forestry beyond 2022. Um, and an additional £160 million worth of funding was announced for forestry and agriculture in the most recent programme for government. And that included £100 million for Scottish forestry planting grants over the next five years. So what are the drivers for integration of forestry into existing rural businesses? Um, it's still sometimes thought that forestry has to be at the expense of farming output. Uh, and all too often that forestry can seen, be seen as competing for prime arable land. Um, however, there are significant opportunities for integrating forestry into existing farm business to increase business resilience. 40 years ago, we spent 50% of our income on food in Britain. Today, we spend just about 8% on food, with margins being continually squeezed, requiring ever increasing levels of business sustainability. All this is placed against the background of uncertainty over Brexit and the future of agricultural subsidies with the likelihood that in future landowners will receive greater payments for the provision of environmental services. Uh, and we've seen in the news recently down in England uh, last week, the announcement of a cut in direct agricultural payments of 50% from next year uh, in favour of monies for the provision of environmental management services. So this means that business as usual is unlikely to be an option for farmers in the future. And in, in such an environment, landowners and managers are increasingly looking for ways to maximise productivity of their land and to find alternative additional income streams and integrating forestry with farming offers valuable opportunities to do just that. The recently published interim farming for 1.5 degrees Celsius report has stated that Scotland cannot achieve its net zero targets without a widespread commitment by the agricultural community, not only to cut the amount of greenhouse gases it releases, but also to take action to reabsorb them too. And key recommendations for the, from the report include a move towards multifunctional land uses, including agroforestry with a report concluding that agroforestry remains one of the most effective ways to achieve Scotland's climate goals across a range of soil types, while improving agricultural and biodiversity resilience and providing a diversity of products. So trees can help to achieve net zero at the same time as maintaining agricultural productivity. And we'll hear more on this from Ian MacDonald next. The Farming for 1.5 degrees Celsius report states that there is potential across all Scottish farms for significant improvements in animal health. And better animal health can support both reproductive and production performances 
and optimise population outputs. It's estimated that up to 20% of agricultural productivity is lost through lameness, mastitis and other avoidable illnesses and shelter benefits associated with woodlands can help reduce this figure. Woodlands, for example, can help with disease control and can provide natural lambing sheds, resulting in an associated increase in postnatal survival rates in lambs by up to 30%. Andrew Bailey of Carstairs and Maine's Farms has planted under underutilised and wetter corner areas of his fields to produce shelter for newborn lambs. He maintains that forestry is an attractive way to utilise underproductive land, especially wetter areas where planting can help reduce the incidence of fluke in sheep. Shelter delivered by woodland creation can help with improved feed conversion rates and livestock productivity. I'm sure, as I'm sure many of you will know, livestock will use up to 50% of their energy keeping warm and dry. So the warmer they are in winter, uh, the less energy they will use keeping warm rather than growing. Sheltered areas have, for example, up to 17% estimated increase in dairy milk production. Andrew Barber, featured in the slide here of Maine Sabosky of Bonsky. It states that the farmer who invests in trees can get the, work, the ground to work in a more efficient fashion and that in a changing climate, improving shelter for the livestock enterprise makes long term financial sense. Creating new pastoral woodlands, which in time is grazed by the stock, is one way to have your cake and eat it. And Mr. Barber has managed to change to keeping the higher value Beltec sheep as opposed to blackface sheep in fields which benefit from shelter belts planted 30 years ago. Just moving on to crop benefits. Approximately 2.9 million tonnes of topsoil are eroded in the UK each year, reducing the long-term fertility of the soil. Infiltration of surface water by trees can help reduce the erosion of topsoils from adjacent fields. And studies in Pont Brown in mid Wales found that water infiltration increased by 60% within five metres of tree shelter belts after just three years of planting. Shelter belts can increase wheat yields by at least 3.5% as a result of more efficient water use in adjacent fields. Grass production in fields adjacent to woodlands in early spring is increased by warmer air and or soil temperatures, and this can allow movement of stock to uplands sooner, meaning less feed is required and that hay or silage fields can be vacated earlier. Shelter can also help prevent crop lodging caused by wind and subsequent harvesting losses. The current system of upland grassland farming demands a lambing percentage in excess of 120% much larger heifers for shepherds and seriously effective in utilisation of in-by pastures um, with a minimum of bought-in feed. The proportion of in-by ground on many hill farms is only 10 to 16 percent, leaving a huge area of the hill underutilised. Here the sheep are able to select the more digestible and nutritious plants and leave the rest, and this permits the big biomass producers, the purple moor grass and rushes etc, to expand year on year at the expense of the more nutritious bent fescue grasses. Increased nutrition can be achieved through accessible quality grazing by encouraging bent fescue grasses through the removal of these larger bio biomass competitors. And the better and, more, better and more accessible areas of the hill can be managed to this end. With careful design, forest blocks with fencing funded as part of the forestry grant scheme can provide these grazing paddocks. And according to a report by the Welsh Woodlands and Timber, areas protected by woodlands have shown a 20% increase in average pasture growth per annum. Just a quick look at some of the wider benefits, which are perhaps less known, but definitely associated with wooden creation. In terms of natural pollination, it's been estimated that the monetary value of insect pollination in the UK is more than £510 million. Pounds. The trees, habitats and plants associated with woodlands provide important overwinter refuges, nesting sites and feeding sources to help sustain pollinator populations throughout the year. Research also shows that increasing elements of non-crop habitat reduces overall pest risk. And these natural pollination and pest control benefits are set against the background of increasing restrictions in the use of agricultural chemicals. In terms of low carbon wood fuel, drives to incentivise the use of low carbon wood fuel in the UK have led to a strong market for wood fuel products. First innings, lower value timber and smaller roundwood, um, unsuitable for other markets, can provide a valuable source of sustainable low carbon and low cost wood fuel, providing incentives to manage existing farm woodlands increasing overall timber quality in the process and incentives to plant new woodlands. And I think we'll hear more upon this point from um, Ian MacDonald in his presentation. well sighted native woodland can also increase the potential of game shooting on farms and estates. And finally, and importantly, natural flood and diffuse pollution control benefits. Um, there are a number of ways in which trees can be integrated into farming systems um, to mitigate pollutants and safeguard water resources 
whilst also helping to support agricultural production. In the case of ammonia, for example, with agriculture can be contributing a, about 90% of the UK's ammonia emissions, studies have shown that shelter belts next to livestock units can reduce emissions by up to 10%. Just a note um, on realising the potential from your woodlands. It's sometimes easy to get hung up on maximising grant income at the outset of, of any woodland creation scheme, and this could come at the expense of long-term profitability of your woodlands. So you should very much plan for the long term to realise the potential. Consider management requirements at the outset, for example, ac access and budget for the long term and not for the short. Just a few final notes. Um, Spurs Forestry has recently published a new walkthrough guide to creating new woodlands. Um, this step-by-step -step guide aimed at small landowners breaks down the process of preparing a woodland creation application into easy bite-sized chunks. Uh, it will help you assess if the land is suitable for tree planting through to preparing and submitting an application for the forestry grant scheme. Secondly, the Farm Advisory Service um, is offering Scottish farmers and crofters up to £1,000 of funding to enlist the help of a specialist advisor to help with woodland creation. The advisor will work with the land manager to add value to underproductive land by reviewing farm-specific opportunities and financial incentives available to create or manage woodland. And to apply for or to apply or for more information, uh, please contact Baz using the contact details on this slide. And just finally, um, for anyone in the Grampian area listening today, um, a limited number of free feasibility studies are being offered by Scottish Forestry to farm businesses in the Grampian region to help the owners assess whether forestry is right for them. And if you're interested in that offer, please do contact Tim Gordon Roberts on, of Grampian Conservancy, uh, whose details are in this slide. So, oh, just in conclusion, um, there are significant opportunities for integrating forestry into rural businesses to maximise business resilience and sustainability. Um, through firstly economic opportunities, the production of an additional timber crop and additional revenue stream, through opportunities for increasing crop yields and fields adjacent to woodland, through animal health benefits and related increases in productivity from shelter provision, through biodiversity and sporting benefits related to woodland, through the production of a source of low carbon wood fuel, and through natural flood management and diffuse pollution control benefits. And this set against the background of uncertainty over future subsidies and a likely move towards the provision of public goods with related uncertainty of the viability of some farming models in the future. And all this at a time when demand for timber is rising and the price for timber is strong. And more on this from David Robertson later on. So I think that's me uh, for the moment. Uh, thank you very much indeed for listening. Anna, can you still hear me? Yes, sorry. It was my mute button was actually going a bit <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> this year's comment, turn your mute button off, Anna. I Is know. that we're just staying on topic. We're, we're making sure we're not sort of like going off topic with the with the new trends. So yeah. <laughs> Um, I have a couple of questions. Thank you, first of all. Thank you so much, because that was really comprehensive. Uh, I have a couple of questions that people have asked, uh, both now and people who have sent their questions because they couldn't be here and they're going to be watching the recording. So again, if anybody um, if anybody wants to revisit it, remember the recording is going to be there. But uh, so the first question is about whether more trees mean more foxes or badgers, which can be a nuisance with newborn lambs on the ground. Absolutely, and forestry has definitely um, been uh, compared to that in the past. And as my uh, my late father-in-law uh, jumped up and down every time, every uh, who was a farmer jumped up and down every time anyone mentioned that, that the mere word forestry. Um, but uh, I convinced him in the end. Um, you know, absolutely, um, foxes and, and and badgers live in woods. Um, they also uh, live in open lands as well. Um, I'm not an expert on, on foxes and badgers, and I would suggest that we maybe need to uh, seek more professional guidance. Uh, it depends on the individual circumstances, obviously. Um, David Robertson, have you any thoughts on this particular question? Um, on the on the badgers and foxes aspect? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, undoubtedly, yes. If you're in an area where you have badgers, um, there's obviously little you can, you can do. Um, you know, there's no, obviously, legal control for badgers. Foxes can be legally controlled, however, um, which is which is part of normal farming life. Um, so, yeah, potentially, potentially, um, an expansion of habitat 
uh, for both species. Um, but if you're looking at small areas of farm units, it's perhaps not significant in point. We'll make sure to address that question as well a bit more length. We can probably ask a few people and include it in the follow-up email. But um, but thank you, because I think that's that's exactly the kind of thing um, that sometimes and doesn't for, for address, a, so. From a personal point of view, I live in a hill farm uh, and we have woodland, we have sheep, uh, we have the odd fox and badger. They are controlled um, and the sheep percentage that this year has been uh, as expected. And um, there are some losses um, but there are also a lot of losses to um, to airborne predators as well, um, and they are unrelated to the woodlands. Perfect. Question from PJ Lewis asking if post establishment is grazing on the forest permitted, and if so, when can it be opened? So effectively, the woodland grant uh, or the forestry grant scheme has a, a time span in terms of. Um, not letting in 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 any livestock uh, and in terms of um having a, a certain stocking density um on your land um if you can um uh open up the gates so to speak and let in livestock without damaging your trees after that time then you know that is entirely your decision um you know do bear in mind that it would have to be managed uh, and it would have to be uh, policed um in terms of any potential livestock damage to trees through for example rubbing or jumping up to try and uh, eat the branches um, I'll have to remind myself of the number of years. Uh, I know Sasha Lang is, is with us today. I, can't, I don't know if she can remember the exact time span, but I will go in, have a quick look, uh, and I'll put the answer in the chat function down the side in just a minute. I think the, I think the, the, the period of years, um, depending on different models, was anywhere between 20 and 25 years for Ginny. Um, That's correct. Thank you, David. However, the, 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 the most important aspect that the trees are not detrimentally impacted. Um, and it could be possible to get stock into a crop earlier than that, as long as the trees have established solidly and there's no detrimental damage to the, to the crop. The, the, the long-term requirement of anybody receiving grant is that they keep the area which has been granted in a woodland condition for the period, so it's 20 or 25 years. And if, as long as grazing stock doesn't, isn't detrimental to keeping that in woodland condition, then it's possible to do it. I would very much um, um, hazard against putting stock into a crop, and um, certainly broadleaf trees younger than 10 years old, because the, the amount of damage that can be done in stripping and such like is, is, is it can be excessive. So it really, really needs to be carefully managed. You know, I don't think there's any harm in putting stock in occasionally for, for a few weeks to graze down vegetation and take them back out again, again as long as it's managed. Thank you, David. I couldn't remember whether it was 10 or 20 years and this being my first presentation in a while, I've just forgotten. So thank you. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I'm going to suggest because of the time, I'm very conscious of time that we move into Ian's. But um, so if Ian, are you in there somewhere? Make yourself known. There you are. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, fantastic. We can see your screen as well. Uh, so, Ian, just the floor is yours. Take it away. OK, uh, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as you said, I'm Ian MacDonald uh, from Ardock and Threepland Farms in Eaglesome. The farms lie 10 miles south of Glasgow. Oh, a pop bubbles just fell off the Christmas tree. Um, yes, yeah, so the farms lie uh, te uh, 10 miles south of Glasgow, totalling 272 hectares. Um, the farms are run as one unit. Um, so it all started in 2013 when I was um, looking to diversify the farm. At that time, the farm was running 170 sucklers, uh, 500 breeding ewes, and now the farm is running 700 as an 85 kilowatt log boiler and 50 hectare, hectares of uh, new woodland. And I'll try and explain how I got to this point. So um, it was in 2013, as I said, that uh, I was reading about new woodland creation and the renewal heat incentive scheme. And um, so looking around the farm, what I into with an average rainfall of 1200, I didn't see a lot of options apart from woodland. So on the farm, we've got some mature woodland, and the first block was five hectares, 
and uh, it was wind-blown mature woodland. So what we decided to do was harvest the area, well applied for a felling licence, harvested the area and um, there's another picture of it. So it was a bit of a mess, what can you do with that on a farm? Not a lot, clear it up. So we ended up with this and uh, at the same time we decided to um, disperse the beef herd and uh, purchased a biomass boiler, Farm 2000 it is, uh, 85 kilowatt and we applied, put it in and applied for a commercial tariff which was running the work, the farm workshop, the house and hot water into the lamb shed. Later that year it was accepted under a commercial tariff and uh, that was how really we got started into it. So that year we also looked into the central belt, uh, sorry that's a picture of the boiler, so I'll go back a minute. So it, the, the boiler takes any size of log up to 1.4 metres long and anything through that big door that you can lift, it will burn. So that is the boiler. So later that year in 2013, um, we applied for a Central Scotland Green Network scheme, forestry scheme. And uh, looking around the farm, you'll see the dark green bits are uh, where we uh, decided to plant trees. Now, 90% 90, 90 of them are hardwoods under the first scheme, and these were mainly planted for shelter belts. I have three farms that we marched with for biosecurity, for the, the basically for the shelter. And um, a lot of them were steep ground, unproductive ground, and uh, probably just problem areas, to be honest. The only bit, as you'll see in the centre of the map, is uh, where the woodland was, the clear fell was taken down, and that was replanted with this, the three skinny bit you can see was a, a a field. So we took it in so we could get the, we got the grant on the full fence round the whole block, although we only got paid to plant the trees on the field side. So that is what the scheme entailed. Now what we did was we uh, got in tow with Jara Forestry and they did our application. So he was our woodland manager and uh, we worked together closely with him to design what was going to benefit the farm. So in 2013 stroke 14 the, the, the application was approved and 29,000 trees were planted. 650 metres up and 2,600 metres, sorry, 650 of deer fence and 2,600 of stock fence. As you can see, this was the what we planted, uh, common all there are all these hardwoods and a small amount of sicta spruce. Um, and there is a picture. That that one there is running along a march for about a mile with a neighbour. We did a strip the whole way. It was very steep over the banking and it was really for biosecurity was our main thing and it wasn't a particularly good bit of ground. This is uh, the bit that we clear felt at the bottom. The bit that's still standing is actually on my neighbours. So the bit at the bottom is the bit that we clear felt and the, f the bit nearest to the camera is the field. So that and that all the fencing was done ourselves. Um, we got in a contractor just to put the strainers in. Uh, again, it was just to save money and with the cows not being there, we had the time to do this. There's another uh, banking. Uh, these trees have done extremely well. Um, Again, it's just a bit pretty hard to gather. We just decided to take these areas out. Um, and you can see the hardwoods there, another bit. They've done extremely well. These photos were taken, I think, three years ago. So I'll show you some in a minute that were more recent. This was the plantation of conifers, approximately two hectares. hectares and it was um, very, very steep. As you can see, it's in a 30 acre field and uh, it was quite hard to gather sheep off it. It was a bit dangerous in the quad bike, so we decided to take it out. Um, as you can see, they, they've all done very well as well. They, that photo was taken about three years ago. Um, in the distance, you'll see mature woodland. That, just for interest, that is the next bit we're harvesting for the biomass boiler. The trees have come to the end of their life and we will be replanting and clear felling that. 
And that is the conifers taken last week, so they are doing quite well. The, on to the weed killing, we did all that ourselves. So all these trees were done three years or three winters with kerb. Um, it's just a granule you sprinkle around the, on top of the tree and round about the tree. It doesn't harm the tree, and um, we got quite good results with that. Here is at the other um, farm, and uh, so what this is, it was a banking. It doesn't actually show it, the, the photograph. It's quite steep down to a burn. The right-hand side is the field that we're farming to now. And the idea of planting this out was it, it was always bad for yows going down and lambing. So we're meaning to lamb on the right-hand side. Um, and you can see the trees now taken last week are up a fair height. And we're hoping for some shelter from them. They are quite... Um, they have done very well as well, so we're very pleased with the first scheme. Um, but there always is some failures, and this is one of them. So this is a small area. It was planted in hardwoods in the first scheme, but uh, it was north-facing. There's only about 800 plants in here, and they have really not done very well. They have been up for a couple of years. Um, we've tried all sorts of things. We don't know what to do. We've taken advice from the, the department. We've taken advice from our field officer and we really know what to do with it. It's um, it really is a bit of a fail. Every year we do put some in to see what we can. I, we think it needs a different plant, um, but we've been, under the rules, we have to plant in the, what was in there, the hardwoods that we put in. So that is probably a so in 2018, after the success of um, after the success of the first scheme, I've seen how it uh, definitely improved the farm. Um, easier to manage the sheep. It was easier to manage really the, the place. It looked tidier. We got a lot of fencing out of it. Um, I decided that I had a piece of land, um, which this block is 37 hectares. Um, wasn't particularly good ground and decided to put in an application through JARA Forestry again. Now, you'll see, just got a note here. So A1, the green, uh, was to be planted in Sitka Spruce and A2, the pink, is Scotch Pine and the boundaries in brown were going to be planted in hardwoods. Now, the total is 37 hectares and this it was approved and this was the what was planted so around eighty thousand trees that is actually low it was more than that i don't know how that's so that's actually wrong it was nearly ninety thousand. um approximately we put up 1950 meters of deer fence 2600 of rabbit netting 650 70 meters was upgraded by stock fence to deer fence and um so yeah, it was approved and uh, we did the fencing again ourselves, just with the contractor putting in the posts. And this is the land that was there. As you can see, it's not particularly um, good land. Um, for years, we lined it, we slagged it, we sprayed it, uh, topped it, and it just kept coming back and back. And I just, just gave up with it, to be honest. You can see here is a good example of the two sides. So the right-hand side below the dike is where we sheep farm. The top side is obviously the bit that uh, we've decided to plant and um, I have not missed it to be honest as you can see by the terrain there. So although this is a greener bit of the hill there wasn't much of it. Um, we That's the forestry plough and um, in that is scotch pine. So they were planted in 2019 it would be. So Again, this doesn't look very good. I'm going to show you a failure. Uh, the Scotch pine that year suffered very badly from drought in the summer and we lost a lot of plants. There was, I think there was 9,000 plants uh, planted and we reckon we lost in the regions of about 80%, to be honest. Uh, we were a bit gutted because the, the sick had done very well and the hardwoods had done very well. 
took advice again and we were told we had to put in scotch pine scots pine again so we re ordered them and um, planted them ourselves and the next year wasn't much better we did there's some of them have come as you can see picture of the dog and um, they have come we still have lost about 25 percent the advice i've been given now is to stop buying bare root maybe david could clarify this one but uh, stop buying bare rooted and buy cells this winter and so we're going to try that to beat them up but we have um, as I say, we have uh, improved it from what it was for the first year. Again, this was done with uh, Kerb in 1920. Yeah, 19 and 20, the first year was forestry plow, so we didn't need to do any weed killing. And um, we got on fine. Uh, we did it at Christmas time when we had uh, three, three children, or free labour, I call it. It takes a bit of time to do 90,000 trees, but with four of you on it, it's amazing what you can do going up and down the rows. Um, my advice is definitely to take on as much of the, if you are doing a forest agroforestry scheme, do as much of the work as you can yourself. You'll you'll benefit at the end with uh, retaining a lot of the grant. Uh, we ordered the trees, we ordered the fencing materials, we organised obviously the fencing, uh, we've taken on the spring and we've taken on the uh, beating up of any trees that have died. Um, so, there's more Scotch pine on this area. And this is uh, the Sitka. So, they've done very well. We're running it about over 95% have survived. Uh, they've been very good. Um, so, you can see the ground again. If you look in the distance, I didn't get a great photograph, but you can see the yews are grazing on the greener side of this bit of ground. So that's what we farm now and we've given up, let's say, this this plot of land. Um, I would say that um, I would say that this agroforestry scheme has been a success on this farm, it definitely has been, and it's improved the farm no end. Uh, the fences are all been tidied up. Uh, we were very lucky maybe with the first scheme that uh, we were allowed to do uh, patches on the farm. They, now I believe they would rather do a, a large block like this one was. Uh, um, this one was done. Um, it's definitely say, been a success. Um, planting has been a good uh, commercial investment. Our bank manager is very happy, um, and he's also told me that on this larger plantation he will bought, he will loan money against it if he were going to do anything in the future, which is obviously good to hear. And um, the accountant. Uh, at our annual meeting this year has told me that he has a client looking to buy these blocks of uh, forest land at uh, our new new forestry at uh, about five year established so that was quite encouraging so it's got to be a good investment in my opinion and um, it's a viable legacy for the next generation um i think really that is about it um so say I'll be any questions I'll take, no problem. I'll be very honest with any of them. Um, I've showed you the, the bad sides, but I think it outweighs the you know the benefits we've had. So yeah, I think that's me, Anna. That is, that is fantastic. fantastic. Thank, Thank you very, very, very much. Very much. Um, um, oh just one thing, sorry before oh, go I, ahead. Go, uh, go ahead. Sorry, the, the last scheme I forgot to say that um uh, one of the benefits was it's just a 10 year scheme, but you retain your single farm payment on it. Um, uh, although we are, we've only got a couple of years left of the big money at five years, the money reduces a bit, but we have retained a single farm on it. So, um, yeah, uh, that's really all. This is a question that actually we, we had uh, via online, someone that wanted to ask before, and it's how much easier has it made just managing the farm overall or you're sort of like, Day to day, how does it change when you incorporate uh, this kind of schemes into your into your farm? It's it, it's it's a it's been a total total change for us, but um, we've absolutely enhanced it. It's been it's been brilliant. Um, instead of mucking cows out and bedding cows, I'm either um, spring trees or splitting timber or bringing timber in um, or, or fencing. Um, it, it's totally changed it. We've, got, we've obviously got the sheep work still, but the two blend very well together for us because. At the moment, not much happening. Tups are still out, um, so we're bringing in timber. We're in the woodshed. 
Uh, lambing time, we don't need to do a lot with the trees because we've already done the beating up through the winter, so it's worked very well together. That sounds great. Uh, PJ Lewis is asking if you'd consider selling carbon credits from your plantings. Yes, um, we were looking at we're looking into that. Yes, we have been looking into that. And another question that again has been sent beforehand is, um, what would you do differently, or uh, if you if you had the chance to start from scratch again? Um, this sounds terrible. Um, on the first scheme, really not very much. Um, I probably wouldn't have planted that um, north facing bit. We, I probably knew myself it would struggle. I, well, I didn't really realise it would struggle, but um, that really not much. Um, we, we, I was always wanting to be very involved in the pricing of everything. Always get three quotes. And no, I, not very much. The Scotch pine at Thiepel has been a disappointment. Um, in the 2018 scheme, it, um, I probably definitely buy bare root or try sales this time and see if that helps. It's considering that's our local, our native um, tree, it was very disappointing. Yeah, I think that we're gonna. There's a few more questions coming in, but I think that we're gonna move to David. Thank you, everyone who's been doing, who's been putting comments in um, in different sort of like links and stuff in the chat again we will we'll share everything that's coming in through it and Ian thank you so much it's really inspiring and it's great to see how well the trees are doing I hope lovely it's actually looking it's a uh, it's quite inspiring just for everyone to know as well there's a case study uh, about Ian's experience that we will share with everyone in the follow up email too in the meantime, if you have any more questions about it keep on putting them on the on the chat Hi Heather, um, and we'll move into David. David, uh, if you want to just get started, we can. And again, uh, I'll keep an eye on all the questions and make sure that I make them as they come. Okay, hey, that's that's that perfect. We can see it. Perfect. Um, bear with me one second. Okay, can you see my presentation there? Yep, perfect. Okay, um, and you can hear me. Loud and, loud and clear. Excellent, that's perfect. Good, okay, thank you very much for having me along today and just good to see some really interesting questions popping up in the in chat function as well. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about trees as an investment in timber crop. Um, Firstly, a little bit about Scottish Woodlands. We're an independent all services forestry management company, so we do everything from cradle to grave. That's finding, finding and acquiring land, and um, seeking the approvals on the landowner's behalf, and taking that through to planting it, maintaining, thinning, felling, ultimately, and and restocking that land at that stage. We manage in excess of 275,000 hectares um, across the UK, worth around about two billion pounds. 195 staff in, in 19 offices, um, and that stretches from uh, Dingwall in North Scotland, just north of where I am in Inverness here, down to the Welsh Marches, down at Chirk, and we also have a, an office, a couple of offices in Northern England and one in Northern Ireland. We're harvesting about 1.2 million tonnes of timber per year, so it's about 3,300 uh, 3, tonnes per day, uh, or 11, roughly 11 hectares. And that equates roughly to what we are planting on, a, on an annual basis um, as well. Um, and we are responsible at the current time for about a third of all the new woodland implementation in Scotland, um, which rather sadly means that we're also doing about a third of the new woodland implementation across the UK. Um, our investment team have been involved in purchase and placing about £150 million worth of properties in the past two years. So buying and selling properties um, for us and farmland. So government support, um, very, very important. Virginia obviously touched on it, Ian's talked about it as well. Um, we, have a, we have a thriving forestry economy in Scotland, um, a £1 billion economy as measured in 2016. I suspect it's significantly greater than that at the current time. Um, we have an annual target, um, well, we're extremely well supported by SNP, by Fergus Ewing especially, and um, has been very good to the forest industry, things like the McKinnon Report and the McKinnon Review, 
which streamlined the application process, which has made a huge difference to, to us as an industry. Um, and last year, we had a combined £52 million pounds worth of direct grants into forestry in Scotland. So you know, that is a, that's a, a, a significant step forward for us. Government support. Um, in February 2019, the Scottish Forestry Strategy was launched, and that really outlined um, a 10-year action plan, but a 50-year vision for forestry in Scotland. And, and that, that vision really started with increasing our uh, woodland cover from 18% of 1.45 million hectares in 2019 up to 21% of 1.68 million hectares by 2032. And to do that, we would require an average of about 13,000 hectares per annum. It also focused as a multi-stream approach. It, it also focused on timber production um, and timber use within Scotland. So you know, a, an aspiration to increase timber use in construction from 2.2 million cubic metres in Scotland to 3 million cubic metres um, by 2031-32. And you'll note here that our, and Virginia mentioned it earlier on as well, that our, our targets by 2024-25 have recently increased from 15,000 hectares per annum to 18,000 hectares per annum. So there's significant impetus behind us um, in that regard. Just to move on to new planting, and a look at where we've been. Um, Looking back at 2010 in Scotland, 2,700 hectares of planting carried out. Um, and we've now moved forward with, again, significant support from the Scottish Government to achieving in 2019 11,200 hectares and this current season just over, just over 11,000 hectares again. Um, and you can see here the, the, the red line represents 2020. And you can see here the steadily increasing expectation of um, target going forward for forestation. This is this is really part of the, the government's carbon strategy and, and that you know, is, is not unsurprising when you consider that one ton of carbon sequestered through woodland planting costs approximately seven pounds, whereas one ton sequestered using mechanical carbon capture, um, for instance locking up from the North Sea production, um, costs over two hundred and sixty pounds a ton. So for the for the government, this is a this is a very economic way of locking up carbon for the future. Come on to land availability. Um, there's roughly eight million hectares of land in Scotland, and of that, five point six five are in agriculture. Um, the map on the, the left hand side here shows the rough distribution um, broken down into very very basic terms of agricultural land. We've got about 0.6 of a million hectares in crops and 4.5 million hectares in grazing. We think when you bear in mind that a fifth of the Scottish population lives on 95% of the land, it demonstrates that, that land availability for forestry shouldn't be a significant issue. When we look at this in a little bit more detail, um, the area in the red box is, is um, agricultural classification 4.2 to 6.2, so you know the ideal type of land that we would be looking to, to plant. And that extends to 2.3 million hectares. So 10% of the area would allow us as a nation to meet the 2030. But when you take into account 6.3 grade land, of which there's another 2.3 million hectares, that means that of all the agricultural grazing land that we're, that we're seeing at the current time of use, 5% of that would be required um, to help us meet the target. So, you know, it puts it within, a, it puts it within an achievable um, sort of range. So, one of the aspects that's, that's key to this is, is looking at average farm incomes. And, and the average farm incomes on here are reported by the Scottish Government for uh, the periods up to 2018-19. And this shows the average farm income for 1819 was £34,000. With subsidy taken out of that equation, this reduces to a loss of £9,300 per farm unit. And this is particularly apparent in LFA stock businesses with, with nearly £60,000 of support going to reach average farm business average farm business incomes of £24,800. 
24,800 pounds. So without support, it's an average loss of 44,000 pounds per year. So you know, significant um, uh, financial um, issues to take into account in there. So why aren't we seeing more planting? Culture, I think, is a, a significant aspect. Um, I think we can all subscribe to farmers' thoughts on you know, the, the, the development of agriculture um, you know, from uh, the, the land that was there previously. And you know, the concern that that will simply go under the plough and be bought out by forestry investors or forestry companies. Um, and we need to be really careful as foresters in, in our industry, we need to be really careful just to, to um, consider the judgment of how that how that happens. Um, you have to be you know, absolutely aware of the, the, the work that's gone into breaking some of this land and converting some of this land into, into what it is and the connections that people have with that ground. But there is still an underlying consideration that conversion of land to forestry is seen to be a failure. Um, but we don't see that as being the case. And I think Ian's demonstrating this morning in his talk that, that you know, it's, it's entirely the right thing to do for the right reasons and for the right areas of land. Um, you know, streamlining of farm assets with strategic placement of forestry to provide real benefits for stock handling and farm economics is, is, is the future. It's not failure. New planting. Um, grants can be substantial. Um, the grants can match or exceed the cost of planting on, on a lot of commercial sites. This bottom right hand side of the budget, which most people tend to tend to want to gravitate to, shows a surplus of over £60,000 for this site. And this specific site was around about 90 hectares gross and 70 hectares of, of planting. So excellent targeted grants in Central Scotland, as Virginia talked about. These are secure and traditionally backed and currently secure for grants approved up to 2025. Sorry, that slide is incorrect. So it's 2025. So just talk a little bit about drivers. Um, for forestry and drivers for investment in forestry and, and I see investment on farm forestry being exactly the same as, as investment in, in wild forestry firms. We, we need timber security now in the UK in exactly in the same way as we did when the Forestry Commission was established in 1919. We have a, an £8.2 billion pound timber deficit, trade deficit on timber products in the UK, and we're the second largest net importer of forest products behind China. When you take into account global timber demand is set to quadruple by 2050, at the same time global population is set to exceed 10 billion, and we're currently sitting at 7.7 .7 billion today. And carbon net zero goals, um, you know, we've got almost a, a perfect storm for, for supply and demand situations in, in the UK. When you look at wider factors like Chinese, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, which is looking to drive, again, trade networks through um, Asia into North Africa, into Southern Europe, you know, they have real potential to upset the traditional trade routes that we've seen for timber into the UK from Northern Scandinavia. So, you know, we need to, we need to be cognizant of that going forward. This graph on the right hand side here demonstrates this to an extent, and, and the graph represents timber use per thousand head of population in, in cubic metres. So in the UK, we use 147, 147 cubic metres of timber per thousand head of population. In the US, where they're much more reliant on timber framed houses, that's 275 cubic metres. But in the emerging nations, where the, the greater demand is coming, it's 25 cubic metres per thousand head of population. So it shows the real potential um, of, of, of changing in, in, in demand and supply in, in UK forestry. When we look back over this and, and see where we've been in forestry establishment terms, um, in the late 1980s, we were planting 30,000 hectares per annum, up to 30,000 hectares per annum. But a change in taxation um, basically took commercial forestry planting, or basically reduced commercial forestry planting, down to you know, just over 5,000 hectares in, in, in 2010. And when you take that in Scottish terms, it was, it was down to, to over, just over 2,000 hectares. We're now seeing significant increases, so um, 13,400 hectares across the UK in, in 2019, 
And in the graph in the top right, worthwhile noting that 11,000 hectares of that 13,400 was planted in Scotland. If we take that lack of planting in the light from the, the, the early 1990s forward, what that means is that we're also coming into a period of undersupply of timber. So by the time we get to late 2030s into early 2040s, we're coming into a period of undersupply to meet current sawmill capacity within the UK. All of these factors taken with the previous factors I've discussed, for us, mean that anything that's planted now comes into a period where timber will be in greater demand, but there will be less supply. Henceforth, we expect that the value for timber will increase. New house completions, an important driver for timber use in the UK. In 2019, we achieved just over 200,000 uh, house completions in the UK. The government in the UK has a target of 300,000 house completions by 2025. Now, given the, the, the current economic conditions, that's highly unlikely to be achieved. But you know, the government are looking to build their way out of the current recession in, in their own words. So you know, there could be a big push in house building. Um, and what we're seeing is a significant increase of those houses being built with timber. So in Scotland, we build about 76% of our houses in timber frames. England and Wales is only about 22%, um, giving us an average across the UK of 26%. In England, that figure of 22% was 16% was four years ago. So we're seeing a huge increase in England of, of uptake in timber frame construction. And that's really driven by off-site construction, where timber frames can be built in factories, taken to site, it gives much better speed and efficiency, and it can be up and established within, within very short periods of time. The main driver for that, again, is carbon. So um, timber has the, the, the major benefit of being the only commercially available material, which, which is available at scale, which can lock up carbon as part of the construction process. All of the other equivalent building materials are net emitters of carbon in their manufacturing processes. So that gives timber a very much a um, uh, 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 a lead in that regard. The, you know, what we're seeing across the UK now are, are, are specific cases where local authorities will, will, will launch housing tenders out to, to building companies and say, you know, you, this is a design and build project, but do not come to us um, unless it's a timber first initiative. So we're seeing that happening quite, quite significantly across the UK now. Mass timber again, a um, significant part of this story. Um, in the States and across Europe now, we're seeing mass timber buildings up to 18 storeys high being approved um, for mass timber is body timber, laminating it together into very strong structural beams, um, which lock up huge amount of carbon in the construction process again. So just to move on to carbon. Um, just over a year ago, the UK became the first major economy in the world to, to pass laws to end its contribution to climate change by 2050. The Committee on Climate Change report um, shown here outlined uh, the route map to achieve net zero in England by 2050 and in Scotland by 2045. And Forestry played a major part in that. Um, and it identified an annual sequestration of up to 22 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent by 2050 as a base expectation. Under the further ambition aims of this report, um, the report suggested planting at a level of 30,000 hectares per annum by 2025 across the UK would be required to meet the target set. And of course, we've seen the UK government launching the, the, the 30,000 uh, hectares per annum initiative um, just in, in recent weeks. And obviously, this is a real challenge, not least with competition for agricultural land. But interestingly, in that matter, the report outlined a significant trend in reduction of grassland area with a predicted repurposing of over 3 million hectares due to changes in grazing intensity and a drive towards healthier diet. So we may see changes coming that do allow us to look at land at the scale that's required to meet the requirements of this report. Carbon, again, charismatic carbon is a, is a major um, aspect of what we're seeing. And somebody asked Dean earlier on whether he's considered selling the carbon units from his farm. This screen that's shown here is the, the first search um, that was returned by Google when, when I searched for ESG Forestry UK, ESG being environmental, social and 
corporate governance, and it turns up a global fintech organisation who've invested in a carbon project in Scotland. So we're seeing a significant amount of people coming into the market to buy to buy carbon, which in turn is driving establishment of a mixture of native and commercial. Mm -hmm. and the benefit of this is is you know is is um, unknown really to the greater extent. But you know whether their contribution is large or small in, in global terms, the figures sound extremely good to investors and other stakeholders. So we're seeing a significant amount of businesses coming in, most of them with very good intentions. Um, this is driving you know, major, major uh, consideration for carbon, carbon type projects across Scotland. And again, what can we expect from carbon? The main figure here is the 7.3 tonnes of CO2 per hectare per year, um, which can be generated within a typical commercial forest. Um, and a lot more on that on the, the CONFOR website if you want to have a visit to that. So forestry investment market, um, just to finish on some figures. Um, let's have a look at that. Okay, so um, recent report released showed that we, we've there's been a big increase in the interest in investment in forestry in the past year. Um, our long-term average investment um, trade in forestry across the industry has been around about £100 million pounds over the past 10 years per annum, and that's been an average of about 12,500 hectares. What we've seen this year um, is almost £200 million pounds being spent in investment forestry, and the uh, the hectareage staying roughly about the 12,000 hectares average. So we've seen a huge increase in the overall value of a forest station. Now, this needs to be taken with a pinch of salt because this was over, there were some significant sales in this of very large scale commercial assets, which have skewed the figure slightly. But nonetheless, what we're seeing is, is a definite uptick in forestry values going forward. And for those who are investing like Ian, um, you know, that's certainly good news. Long-term averages over this period, 2010 to 2020, have shown a 14.2% per annum increase in overall average prices. Take that 2016 to 20, it's 21%. And this short-term increase that's been represented last year showed a 39% increase across the board. Again, please treat that figure with extreme caution because it was skewed by some very large sales and some very large figures. So what's driving this? Um, very simply, the blue line is a conifer standing sale price index, and the brown line is the average price per conifer hectare, as represented in my previous graph. And you can see that these are two are, are, are running in synergy together, um, up to a point where actually the conifer standing sale price index increased ahead of the average price per, per hectare for, for conifer crops. That was a spike in the timber price, that corrected in late 2019, but actually is rising significantly again in 2020. So underpinning these large increases that we're seeing in over 12% per annum over the last 10 years um, is the underlying timber price, which is, which is good news for those who are investing. So it's just a general uptick in, in trend. So finally, conclusions. Um, Woodland forestry planting provides significant opportunity for diversification of farm units. Um, natural capital is providing benefits not only for the farmer and landowner, but also wider society benefits. And I think we're going to see this coming in any agricultural um, support system that, 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 that follows on from the current system we have. The use of planting to streamline and simplify farm boundaries, as Ian has done, um, and make for easier stock management is, is really a win-win for, for those involved. Uh, improving stock health and survival, as has been talked about. Vitally important, converting areas of high areas of high output improves the economics of farm units. And um, so, you know, vitally important for people to consider. I think final point is that woodland is no longer seen as an activity of last resort and failure on farming units. In my opinion, this is uh, this is really um, demonstrating somebody who has forward vision and is looking to diversify their asset to make the most of it. Uh, for a longer term. So thanks for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Hope I haven't gone massively over time, but um, we'll take it from there. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, David.
Um, the chat has been quite active all the way through. So, so I'll, I'll show you, Virginia, you wanted to talk a little bit about, there's been a lot of, oh, let me just, I'm going to mute you, David. Anna, you're repeating and echoing quite a lot on me. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot of people that are getting blamed by David. So. Okay, I'll switch off my mic. No, it's, there you go. I refuse to take responsibility. I hear that. Right. There was enough of lot of uh, there was a lot of chat in the uh, of conversation in the chat around um, agroforestry grants and what involves yes. and other things. So I was wondering if you could actually summarize a little bit of what you were talking with Cheryl or Alistair there, because I think it would be interesting for everyone. Uh, and then we can move into questions for David. Super. Sorry, I, I, I'm guilty of falling down the rabbit hole that you can end up in in chat. Um, I need to bring myself in. Um, yeah. So just in terms of agroforestry, um, it is. Uh, by agroforestry, um, we can look at the, the slight confusion in terms of what precisely agroforestry uh, means. Um, agroforestry is actually the integration of, of trees into farming systems, but there are there is a kind of more specific level, uh, the individual field level uh, of agroforestry, which involves the integration of um, of crops uh, and trees, or the integration of of livestock uh, in in the in the example of the the um, agroforestry option for the forestry grant scheme sheep. Uh, and trees. Um, so it's very much at that integrated individual field level. Um, it is a relatively new concept in Scotland. Uh, it's, it's not so new on the continent. There's many more examples over there. Um, and it is a, a more specialist area. But there, are, there are increasing numbers of people doing it uh, and doing it successfully. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's that individual uh, integration of, of trees and livestock or crops at the individual field level. Um, there is um, a, a large amount of research being done at the Farm Woodland Forum, um, which anyone can join. It's run by a gentleman called John Holland. Uh, they have lots of discussion around the area of agroforestry um, because it is you know, a, a new area. Um, but it is absolutely something that can work. Um, it is something that's perhaps a more, a more long term um, uh, proposition, but then forestry is a long term proposition anyway. Uh, it might not suit all farms and specifically for the agroforestry um, option under the forestry grant scheme uh, there is uh, let me just remind myself um, there are um, limits in terms of the grade of agricultural um, land that you can um, apply for um, I'll not find this in like in fact I'll, I'll, I'll send this to people uh, in, in, a, in a response after after the meeting today um there was a question here, uh, John asking, I'm not sure if this would be for David or Virginia, but is anyone consider the impact of this on the tenanted sector? Uh, because the initiatives for tree planting is likely to put great pressure on tenants from farm, farm uh, landlords wanting to take back the land. So. Yeah, well, in, interestingly, I was involved in a, um, uh, an agricultural law conference um, a couple of weeks ago where um, Bob McIntosh spoke, um, and uh, you know there there are moves afoot to to consider the interaction between tenants and landlords in relation to the establishment. It, it it is seen as a significant barrier at the current time, um, and something that that requires to be resolved um, in relation to you know allowing tenants to have more control over over planting on their own land. Um, so yes, definitely something that's been looked into um, by the, the tenant farm commissioner um, and, and something that has been considered in, in wider circles. Unfortunately, I can't give you any more detail of it. It was, it was very much a discussion point at the Agricultural Law Association, but um, yeah, definitely recognised as being a barrier for some people entering into the, the woodland and forestry sector. In the yeah, and we have a working group uh, now within Scottish Forestry looking at this exact, um, exact issue because it is an, is an important one, absolutely. Great, and again, uh, we'll be sharing any new information. We have your information. We can actually share it as it develops. Um, again, going back to agroforestry, uh, Ian here is actually mentioning that there is a RIS agroforestry group. RIS is um, it's called it's the Rural Innovation Support Service, which means farmers come together in through with working with a facilitator. They look for solutions to any pressing questions they have. 
they do have a Facebook group uh, and that they've been sort of like talking about agroforestry and everything. And I'll make sure to share it because there's a, a lot of information and a lot of discussion from the ground. So uh, people like the barbers are there. Uh, it might be an interesting place for you to know. Uh, as, as you mentioned, Virginia, there's a couple of people really combining them in a very effective way. And that brings me sort of like back to Ian, if he's here. Um, there were a couple of questions about how your sheep have integrated or not integrated with the trees and what's happening in that front. Sorry, say that again, the, how, how the sheep have... Yeah, what sort of like, are they shocked by the trees, using the trees, hiding from the trees, not getting into the trees? How is it, how's the behavior? Shocked by the trees? No, no, they're not shocked. No, no, it's, it's, um, no, no, it's worked very well. Um, the, the, the areas in the first scheme that we planted, some of them were wet, so the, there definitely has been less fluke on the farm. Uh, fluke is a, a disease of the liver, and um, so uh, it's a wee, a wee um, I don't know, it's a, a, not a, a worm, but a, a fluke egg goes into the liver. So, yeah, it's, shutting off the wet areas has definitely improved the health of the sheep for gathering. It's definitely worked well together, yes. The sheep have benefited, no question. Great. Here's another question from Angela, who says, uh, it seems that forcing marginal strips in small awkward areas work well for the uh, overall good of the farm. Is a change to only larger blocks detrimental to this uh, on the basis of needing to convert land to forestry for sequestration and uh, the monies? <laughs> I'm Michael Max and Michael. You, you, you're being tripped up by a good by a good Scottish saying. Yeah, I, 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 I think Michael I'm Michael Max did, did it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, that money, I'm Michael Max and Michael. Should there be a review system to allow the best fit for farms? Um, I'll, I'll I'll start on this one. Virginia yeah. might be able to, to back me up on this, but I, I, I think Angela, the main the main point is. The average size of a forestation project in Scotland is still only around about 20 hectares, Virginia. Is that correct? Hold on, I've got it, I've got it just here. Hold on just a second. Uh, give um, me two so, seconds. Yeah, so you know, the, the, the average scale of a forestation is still extremely small. There, there, are, there are a few large scale, large scale schemes which would tend to hit the headlines, three, four, five hundred hectares in scale, but you know, the vast majority of the forestation that's being done in Scotland are being done by farmers like Ian, who are making the most of the efficiency of their farms and, um, and and planting bits that no longer make sense for them in agricultural terms. You know, so You're right. Sorry. Moni Amigo does mack a muckle as far as the, 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 the forestry establishment um, market is concerned. David, you're correct. The majority of woodland creation projects, or in fact, over 90 percent of them by number and 60 percent by area are smaller scale plantings being delivered by farmer or existing owners. Uh, with 40% of that being native woodlands. So uh, very much we do have the larger blocks, but a lot of it um, is smaller blocks uh, on farms. If I can just say that the, the larger, um, the second scheme, the larger one, uh, the one block uh, is definitely going to be a commercially uh, more viable and profitable when it comes to harvest time. But uh, it hasn't benefited the farm the same as the small, the, the small areas in the first scheme have definitely improved the farm. That's a personal point. But I can understand they are not viable when it comes for harvesting, although they're, 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 they've got very good quality hardwood trees now and you can see they're going to be good, but definitely financially the big block, but as I say, definitely the smaller blocks has enhanced the farm. Yeah, and it, I, think it's, I think it's worthwhile pointing out in, in my presentation that, that you know, the, the uplift in values relate to the type of larger project that you did, you know, the, the 40 hectare block. You know, it's it's that kind of scale that that is that is really looked at in, in, in that commercial assessment in these values. So you're not getting the same kind of uplift in, in, in value of smaller farm woodlands, but you're getting the, the, the associated side benefits that you've talked about. It's very much what the what your objectives are for your land, uh, and there are you know various different objectives for various different landowners, whether it be a diffuse pollution control, whether it be shelter for livestock. Uh, whether it be immunity woodlands uh, or whether it be uh, income generation uh, and that the latter you would definitely want to be looking at the larger blocks um, but the, the former uh, uh, objectives you might want to look more towards a smaller planting uh, and perhaps the, the native planting. Um, Anna may I ask you a quick question? 
go ahead. Are we going to have time for the Woodland Creation video? We do have time. We're actually going to have two more questions and then we're going to have the video just because everybody we've been talking a lot about farms, but we've not seen a farm in action it was actually being planted. And uh, Virginia has a lovely, brilliant email uh, email video. I'm going to add the in the chat. So we have time for one more questions just to make sure that we do that. And Ted has a question about the potential pest and disease issues for the farm and meeting targets if it's a monoculture that you plant. We'll be stepping in on that one. Um, the potential pest and disease issues for farm and meeting targets of planting monoculture species, etc. Um, we are we are heavily heavily reliant on on the production of sitka in, in UK for production of forestry for commercial forestry. Um, farm units very much will tend to be because they tend to be in slightly better ground, perhaps might be more diverse and more likely to be more diverse. So you more species diversity and um, you know, mixtures of broadleaves and conifers for longer term retentions. You know, designing certainly woodland, farm woodland type schemes, it makes much more sense to have a mixture of broadleaf and conifer on the site um, if you're looking at shelter belts because you never have that overall loss of shelter. You know, you're not felling it and starting off at square zero again, ground zero again. Um, so much more, much more opportunity there. And, you know, it is recognised that relying heavily on a single species is um, is risky, um, but you know, we have extremely stringent plant control, plant health control in the UK through forest research, which is still a, despite the devolved governments and devolved forestry commission, um, it is still a UK-led initiative um, across uh, across the four nations. So, yeah. Um, we will deal with what comes up if it comes up, but at the current time where we are, we are where we are. And uh, just to just to add to that, absolutely, diversity is key in the stand, and the forestry grant scheme is is incentivising or not incentivising, but uh, encouraging people uh, to look at rules. Um, and every option has um, a certain element of, of native broadleaves. Uh, we also have a diverse conifer model um, in the forestry grant scheme to encourage. Uh, diversification of woodland and as you say you know, David reliant we are heavily reliant on one species in this country but currently at the moment uh, Sitka is 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 fine. Um, just in terms of you know reducing the risk of pest diseases uh, well managed woodlands are far less likely um, to be um, badly affected by disease or or less likely anyway to be affected by disease and pests. So you know the key is to having diverse and well managed woodlands as well. I'm going to ask you uh, if you have any final comments, Virginia, Ian, David, because uh, it's been, I know that it's been great. We have uh, a lot of resources in the chat that will be shared with everyone. If anybody else has any more questions, they can keep them coming. Uh, we'll also make sure to share certain contacts, uh, for example, about the people on Sky that are doing agroforestry. So don't worry about that, but it would be nice to have your final comments, Virginia, Ian, David. Uh, and sort of before we sort of like thank you for everything, but we'll leave that for afterwards. Ian, you've got some quite good comments. But you've got some quite good um, uh, ad hoc comments. You, 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 you. Um, mm, uh, well, have you, do you not just, say, just get on and do it? Well, yes. <laughs> well, yes, that was one I've been quoted saying, yes. Don't, don't hesitate, just get on and do it. If your farm is suitable, though, not every farm is suitable, as David said, and our farm was very suitable and it has enhanced it financially and definitely the running and look of the farm. So I would say to do it. And anyone that wants to speak to me on a one to one, they can phone me or once COVID goes, you know, I'm, would, anyone seriously looking at doing it, um, they're more than welcome to come and see the farm, see what we've done. We already have done an on-farm um, visit with yourself, Jenny, and I think it was a success. So, you know, I'm more than happy to do a one-to-one -one with anyone. But yeah, just if you're interested and your farm suited, just do it. Yeah, I don't see any downside. That's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, We're going to end up coming yeah. in a bus. But that's about as good as a that's about as good a, a recommendation as we can get. You know, I, I, you know, I would I would mirror that as well. You know. We see a lot of people, a lot of people in the same position as Ian, who, you know, their, their farm units are just simply streamlined. They're made much, much easier to manage. They, they, they stop 
banging their head against the door on the on the piece of ground that, that causes them problems on a on a daily, weekly, annual basis and costs them money, and they convert it into something which is a which is a valuable asset going forward for the for the family business. Um, so you know, I would just say go and do it. Um, shameless plug. Um, of course, if you want, if you if you would like a free farm woodland assessment, contact us at Scottish Woodlands, um, and always happy to do that. Um, but uh, I'll I'll stop the shameless plug at that point. Well, that's a quid pro quo for always helping us out with presentations, David. For it. So there you go. <laughs> Um, in terms of my personal comment, uh, and this is a personal one, not a business one, uh, I grew up on a dairy farm where we had absolutely no trees whatsoever. My father hated trees. Uh, well, I think we had a small patch of woodland we used to play in, and that was it. Um, roll on. Um, a couple of decades later, I won't tell you how old I am, uh, but the farm is now absolutely transformed by woodlands uh, in terms of water, um, and you can just you just need to walk onto land to tell uh, areas that were used to have cows you know, falling over steep grass, uh, steep hills. Uh, now uh, have wooden creation projects on, which has benefited the whole farm without a doubt. So yeah, you know, uh, it absolutely works. It is uh, uh, site specific, so you need to plan it for your individual circumstances uh, and do very much think about it in the long term. It's very easy to focus on your perhaps the the the, the, the least productive areas of your farm, but is that also in the middle of nowhere? Uh, have you got access to it? Is it a viable? You know, if you're looking for uh, an, an economic investment. Uh, and not, uh, for example, you know, an immediacy woodland, you know, can you access that for future operations um, realistically from where it is? And that, that's key. Planning at the beginning is absolutely key to the success of your long-term woodland and from realising the benefit that you want to get out of it. That's brilliant. I have no words. This has been an amazing morning. I've really enjoyed myself and I learned an awful lot. Again, as I tell everyone, you're going to have all the information, all the contacts, but before we go, I'm actually... You can see it in the chat. I've just um, put the link to an amazing video where you're going to be seeing more of Virginia, but this time out in the woodlands, out in the wild. You can see actually her little um, properly dressed for this kind of weather because I think it was winter as well that you recorded it. So it's very topical uh, where you can learn a little bit more from a, from a perspective of farmer about sort of like woodland creation, what the benefits are of the farm, and what the benefits are of the farm today, but in the future as well. Virginia, is there something that you would like to add to that uh, description of the video? Uh, no, I, I think you've overestimated my part in it, uh, Anna, but uh, no, Peter Gascoigne um, just says it brilliantly. Uh, it's, it's a clear example of woodland working on a farm, so I hope you all find it useful, um, and I hope you will click on the link just now. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope that this was useful. If you have any questions afterwards, always feel free to just send them either by mail. You have my phone number as well. If you have more questions about how to contact David, Ian, Virginia, the information is going to be in the follow up email. But if for whatever reason you need anything else, just give us a shout and let us know. And I hope that you have a brilliant, brilliant day. Bye, Ian. Bye, Virginia. Bye, David. Thank you very much, Nana. Thank you, Ian and David. Talk to you soon. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.